thank you so much for inviting me. It's really a pleasure and a privilege to be able to be here. I I brought a few slides, and I've also said that I'm willing to share these slides with you afterwards so that you you don't have to sort of scribble down everything that I'm saying uh, at all points. Um, As you said, I'm a professor of (coughs) human-computer interaction uh, from KTH, which is the major engineering university in in Stockholm, in Sweden. Uh, I'm actually Norwegian uh, by birth. We won't talk that again. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm both a member of and not a member of the European Union, then, which is an interesting thing. And uh, another, uh, so I have six jobs that I've listed here that I'm trying to do. And another, the, the sort of most recent of one is that I've started as a guest professor at INSEAD, uh, which is a, a business, a prestigious business university in uh, France, which is so interesting because at that point I'm teaching uh, business leaders of the world uh, in their advanced management program on digitization and leadership and management mm-hmm. because I think that that's really one of the issues for the future, I would say. Um, the interesting thing, uh, wha- how come I started thinking about the leadership role in, in mm-hmm. terms of this? Well, it's actually mainly because I got the role a few years ago to be the dean of our school. So I, uh, I'm, this is sort of what takes most of my daytime job these days, to be a manager, to, to deal with Excel sheets is sort of the main tool in a sense. So I'm a dean of the School of Computer Science and Communication. We have about 370 researchers uh, working there on all different aspects of the softer side of computer science. So we have theoretical computer science. We, we have my co-dean is, is actually a robotics uh, professor. We have neuroinformatics, which is sort of visualized in the middle picture there. We have speech technology. This, this uh, fur hat that we call it that we have there is actually exhibited right now mm-hmm. at the British Museum in London. Mm -hmm. Uh, where you can walk up and interact and speak with it and it recognizes your voice uh, and and, uh, you can talk with it in an amazing way. Uh, We're working with uh, visualization, with uh, all sorts of emotional uh, uh, relationships to technology, which is fascinating in our school. But me personally, I've been always very intrigued and fascinated by Uh, Not so much the futuristic side of HCI, human-computer interaction, but the sort of more current day-to-day type of job. So I usually show this slide to to give a a, a picture of various types of projects that we've been involved with, working with all situations where you use computer support for your working life. And uh, that uh, can be everything from healthcare to to maneuvering high-speed boats that we have an example of of down here, or uh, controlling the train traffic of Sweden. Or uh, the middle picture down here is actually from the uh, power plant Vattenfall in in Sweden, who controls most of of uh, northern Europe's energy production. And the fascinating thing is when you go in and study their work domains and see how you can help, you will actually discover that they, they do most of their work through Excel. Because nowadays energy production is a business. You should produce as much energy as possible when the price is high. So they recruited people from the stock exchange to develop their computer support. And they develop it based on what they know the best, which is Excel. And it's been running without interruptions now for eight or nine years. Uh, and it doesn't follow many standards of what you're doing, and it's uh, sort of very much tailored for that sense. Um, I've also been uh, quite active in the ISO community writing standards, so this is sort of one of my driving forces in this, uh, to look at we want to have things to be more usable uh, in every possible sense. How can you increase the usability of the things that we're doing? And there's an ISO standard on usability that I've that's currently being revised now, so there will be a new version out very shortly. Uh, and that's uh, applicable to any type of interactive uh, device. It's applicable to this one or to the light switch over there or whatever you do. And it sets quite high targets for things that we would want to achieve. 
Uh, uh, already in the late 90s, I encountered uh, another fascinating uh, research area that I've engaged myself in uh, quite a bit recently, and, and this is probably a good example of, of such a situation. Uh, this is one of my former colleagues, Frederick. Uh, uh, at that point, he was a PhD student. The amazing thing with him, if you see, is that his display is actually put in a very strange place. It puts on the side and it's shut off because Frederick is blind. And uh, he has been able to get a PhD in computer science and go through all the educational system despite the fact that he has some challenging disabilities uh, to work with. So this has intrigued me a lot. How can we work with improving uh, the situation for, for these people? So I, I sort of to jump to a picture, I, I usually take this picture to illustrate what I'm aiming for. It's a photograph I took from the airport of Shanghai. Um, I don't know if, if you are able to see and understand what it is, but there's a normal uh, uh, bathroom here. Uh, which has big open portal, everybody can sort of easily walk in. There's a disabled toilet on the, the uh, right hand side here on the picture. And to be able to open that you need to press a button yes. that is so high up that you need to sort of get out of your wheelchair like this to be able to reach it. But if you do that, you will discover that, that uh, there's a yellow sign there in, uh, saying that the, the automatic door is out of order. Um, so uh, when I uh, saw a person in a wheelchair approaching this door, uh, I, I went up and actually opened the door for them. And then we discovered that the wheelchair that they had borrowed from the airport was too wide to get in. So, and this is typically what happens, that, that you strive for accessibility and you want to make it doable for somebody that has, has uh, particular problems, but not actually make it as usable as it is for everybody. So this has been my mission for, for uh, the last few years to work with this. As sort of a picture illustrating the most recent project we have, we've been working with IT for people with mental and, and cognitive disabilities. We've been working with homeless people to see and study and understand what type of technology that they could use and how their life would become so much better by the use of that. And this is a group that is, is almost invisible because they rarely respond to, to uh, national queries uh, and things like that. So they more or less doesn't exist from a statistical point of view. But they, they could benefit so much by having a, a better working life in, in that sense. So I have many fascinating stories to tell about this group and what you can do around that. Uh, a few years ago, I got uh, my other uh, daytime job. I got to be, become the chairman of uh, what's called the Committee for Digitization, working under the government of uh, the Ministry of the Enterprise in the Swedish government. Although I'm Norwegian, I got this job, which is sort of fascinating. It's an apolitical job. I don't have to, to uh, subscribe to any political parties to be able to get the job. I'm supposed to help uh, the IT minister on suggestions on what IT politics Sweden should do to, to uh, actually improve and meet the goal that they have set out, the ambitious goal of being the best country in the world when it comes to using the opportunities for digitization. Um, and uh, so I got that assignment two years ago. Uh, we had an election this fall, but my assignment keeps on, so I'm now uh, working for a new IT minister that I haven't so far met, uh, so I don't have a fresh picture, so it's the old IT minister you see there on the picture. Uh, we're working a lot to um, try and understand uh, how good we are at digitization and where we have the problems. So there's actually a, a quite nice website that's only available in Swedish, uh, but it's called digitalasverige.se. Um, <coughs> Several people have been using it through Google Translate and have been able to study it. There we've actually displayed all types of statistics you can find on the use of internet and technology and compare uh, different things. 
So, so uh, we made this available a year ago, and we gave one of our uh, biggest newspapers an advanced preview of this. <coughs> and, and of course, one of the they went into this database and did all sorts of queries to come up with the headlines the next day that said Sweden is worse than Kazakhstan when it comes to using IT for public services within the healthcare sector, things like that. This is statistics that you can find through this. Uh, so we're trying to work with this. we're trying to work with concrete proposals to the government on what they can do. I put the focus on one issue for last year for our uh, latest report that we had, and that was how can Sweden improve when it comes to using computers and digital tools in the school? Because uh, the PISA surveys that you you're probably very familiar with uh, shows that Sweden is actually doing very badly. Uh, when it comes to, to uh, skills on mathematics and natural science and so forth. And um, the ministry has put a, a, a high ambitions when it comes to actually improving uh, the school system. The Swedish school system is one of the few things that is actually not working as well as it should. <coughs> Uh, the role of being a teacher is considered one of the most low prestige jobs that you can have and I believe that this is one of the issues that is mm -hmm. contributing to this. So we put suggestions on that out. Now we're working further on, on uh, other issues and our next report will be issued in, in uh, mid-March this year. And our job comes to an end by the end of 2015. Um, at the same time I got this job, I got another job, which is sort of similar, more or less, being a digital champion, because it's not an award, as you probably have heard from the previous digital champions that have been here, it's actually a job. My job description I got from Nelly Cruz, the, the commissioner in charge of this when I was appointed, was a high-profile, dynamic and energetic individual responsible for getting everyone in the country online and improving digital skills. I get no pay for doing that. I'm just supposed to, to make use of, of my name and contact network and whatever opportunities I have for doing this. And the first time I met, uh, met Nelly Cruz, who I've actually met more times than I've met the Swedish IT minister, I should say, she, because she's very accessible <laughs> and very engaged in this. She's been here this. quite a few times. Yeah. yeah, I saw on the list that she'd yeah. been speaking here also. She said, ah, you're the digital champion of Sweden, your task is easy, she said. And I don't believe that it is easy, because if you're one of the sort of leading countries in this, you can't sort of look at what other people are doing and copy that. You need to be the pioneers on trying out these things yourself. Then one of the things that to serve both the commission and the government that we wanted to do was to find out how good are we? And how good is Ireland in that? And it could be interesting to see. So I had a, now that the World Economic Forum is going on in Davos, we could bring up their, their studies that they have. And, and this is from 2012, where they have the Network Readiness in, Index. And Sweden is number one in terms of network readiness. I tried to read in the visualization here, and, and you can actually find, but you can't find Ireland in the top 20 list here, but you, you can find it someplace here, I think, yeah, I saw IRL, IRL there you are. On, on, on this list. A way of measuring how, how you're developing, weighing together a lot of different aspects of this. This was in 2012. In 2013 uh, there came a new report and the problem was that, that since Sweden dropped two places from first to third, they didn't want to update the graphics on things. I only have the graphics for 2012. And uh, the, the, the question is, why are they dropping and is it serious? Um, well, I think that a few countries are actually developing faster. Finland and, and Singapore was the one taking uh, first and second place now, are sort of very ambitious in the uh, resources they put into to digitization and so forth. Uh, but clearly we're in an area, this is from the International Telecommunications Union, we're in an area where uh, the Nordic countries are, are doing very well. So here on the top list of the, the uh, when they want to measure the information society, Korea is number one, and then the Nordic countries have places two to six in this. 
UK is, is developing very fast here as well. They're doing a lot of different activities in relation to this, which is interesting. And uh, the, all of these indexes are weighing together a lot of different figures on these things. And, and you can actually go into the EU Commission's Digital Connect site and get, get these uh, uh, diagrams out yourself on to show whatever facts that you want to show. So in the share of EU citizens with low or no internet skills, we have sort of where Sweden up here on, on place number three in this. And where did we have Ireland? Ireland is down here, mm -hmm. slightly below the EU average in, in, uh, in that sense. Maybe you can help me explain why this is in a sense in the discussion afterward. So these are the few things that we're thinking about. In Sweden we have a unique statistics situation. We have a, an organization that every year for the last 15 years uh, have produced a report called the Swedes and Internet. They wanted to follow what was happening in terms of the internet development. So they're doing annual service, uh, surveys on this. So here's the, the use of uh, computers, the green one, internet, the blue one, and broadband, the yellow one, to understand how uh, the country is developing. And what you're seeing is that the development has sort of come to a plateau. It's, it's not developing more. So now we have about 91, 92% of the population uh, aged above 18 who has ex access to, to these things. And then thinking, well, who are the non-users? Who are the one that we could recruit? Since my task as digital champion is to get everyone online and improving digital skills. Well, this one is showing this. The orange color here is representing people aged 76 or above. That's where we have the majority of our non-users. Between 66 and 75 is the 20%, so that's the second biggest there. So clearly getting the elderly population online is, is one thing. Uh, the cynical people would say that, well, they will die off eventually, so it's not a problem. But, but I, I don't think so. I'm trying to work uh, with different campaigns to actually... Uh, make uh, the older population see the benefits of this. One of the things I did was, was I got an iPad for, for a tablet computer for my mother-in-law, who's 75 and has arthrosis, so her fingers are quite sort of crumbled like this. And she's, she's never liked computers, but the iPad, she started doing everything. She, she bought food online and bought tickets for the theater and, and played Word Feud and whatever you can do, do with this. And I said, well, you've never liked computers. And she said, this is an iPad. This is not a computer. <laughs> so it's kind of fascinating, uh, the attitude towards things such as this. So how come people are not using it? This is really interesting figures, I think. We asked those, and this is uh, one year before uh, then, we asked uh, the 1.1 the million Swedes that are not online, why are you not online? And uh, we thought it was usability problem or lack of money to buy a computer or accessibility problem, but it wasn't. As many as 77% say that they're not interested. Mm. They just don't care. Many of them actually are online, but they don't know it. So we, we had an interview with, with uh, two youngsters in, in the urban areas in Sweden that were, uh, where one guy was saying, I refuse to use everything digital. And his friend was saying, what, you're watching DVDs? DVD is not digital. He said. <laughs> and and so, so many people are actually doing, doing services. Yeah. They're watching weather online and things mm -hmm. like that, but they don't see it as using internet. In Sweden, it's actually more than 50% uh, of all two-year-olds that are online. 50% of two-year-olds, and that, that's actually amazing. quite fascinating mm. and amazing. And you w would want to know why, and I'm, I'm going to actually detail this a little bit more here. Here's what, what they're doing, age two, three, four, five, six, and so forth. And here is, is watching video. Here is playing computer games. And, but very early on they start, the uh, red one here, is to use internet to search for facts. Mm -hmm. 
And you see that, that already in the beginning, that is more common than using chat or social, social networks. And at the age of about 10, they're actually using internet more for fact-finding than they're using it to watch video. Mm. So, so the, the, the sort of rumors or gossip that, that this is something that is destroying our ki kids today, I don't believe that. And I believe that this is evidence for that. Um, a few things that I just wanted to, to share before we can jump into more of discussions, and this comes also from the European Union. One of the threats to the European Union today is the lack of skilled people in ICT. Uh, Nelly Cruz made the prediction that uh, by the end of 2015 there would be one million lacking people in the ICT sector. Mm. Uh, this is based on calculations made in every country that they added, uh, added to get, uh, together. And uh, the interesting thing as being a university professor is how do we deal with this? Well, this, is, this diagram here is showing sort of the increase of vacancies in the digital sector and the red one is showing the, the growth of the education system, how many people we educate. And you see that this is going to become really uh, bad in the end. So we really need to work to tackle that in a way. Uh, one of our biggest problems in Sweden is the lack of females in the ICT sector. It's, it's around 10%. It is that in the uh, computer science education. It is that in the industry. And it's, it's really a, a problem, I would think. Uh, the other thing... Uh, from the same uh, speech by Nelly Cruz is also the uh, lack of uh, digital skills of those that are using this. So 53% of the workforce thinks that their digital skills is at such a level that they don't really think that they could go and look for a new job. You know, you have so many systems you use in your job situation and you feel that I just can't cope with learning this over again with so many different things in a new situation. So they rest with the job they have that are actually not, not uh, <coughs> a very good one. So, so these two challenges are things that I think that, that we, we should uh, work for a little bit more. Uh, the biggest threats to development, if I summarize this, is, is the lack of skilled and talented people in, in this. We need to focus a lot on getting everyone interested. Uh, and for us at universities, we could for sure, I could easily next year start uh, getting twice as many students as I got before. But the problem is that the students are not there. If I start admitting twice as many students, the students that I would have to admit would be so, have so little skills to start with. Because those that are good students, they don't go for computer science. So they lose interest in computers, ICT, much, much earlier. And this is a really big problem. And therefore, I also believe that we need to work more for actually educating and developing people all through their lives. Because people start learning at two years of age and, and continue doing so further in this. If I could be allowed two or three more minutes before we jump into discussion, I wanted also to raise another problem that comes with digitization. Or maybe it is an opportunity. And it's, it's based a little bit on, on theories that, that uh, Andrew McAfee, uh, that you may have heard of, his TED Talks is really excellent in, in this era, uh, uh, is looking at. And it's based on, on research from, from Carl Benedict Frey from Oxford University. And he's looking at which jobs will disappear due to digitization. And is this a really a problem that they are disappearing? And uh, uh, he's saying that, that probably half of all the jobs that exist today will disappear within a 20-year uh, period of time. And he's actually made a, a visualization of this that I will show in a minute. But if you just start thinking, what do you think are the jobs that will disappear? What did you say? Poets. Poets. <laughs> no, no. Yeah? No, the thing is that, that the, the top one, the one where 98% of everybody that are working there will disappear is photo models. <laughs> because you 
deal with the picture so much after you've taken it and, and morph and uh, change that so much. So there won't be any need for photo models at all. You could sort of u use avatars in the future to do these. So a lot of the, the sort of standard r routine things, library assistant, cashiers, office workers, uh, uh, sort of, of kind of hard, physically hard jobs, those are the ones that will disappear. The least <laughs> one likely to disappear are agronomes, <laughs> priests, psychologists, <laughs> politicians, <laughs> CIOs, <laughs> even things like that. And this is very fascinating. And, and this is made based on, this is what the Swedish labor make, market has done when they've gone through and analyzed sector by sector according to Carl Bendig Frey's uh, studies. If you want to read his paper and look at his visualization of things, you would see that he's actually gone through the based on, on, on what it would look like in the US, mm -hmm. which is clearly a, a bit di different. But then you would see the probability of computerization uh, see from zero to one here. You would see that, that here are the jobs that would not disappear. So the blue the ones is management, yeah. business, financial, uh, uh, computer engineering, science, education, legal, and healthcare. Those would stay. Uh, but those that will disappear, the our oh, service, sales, real, uh, retail, office work, and so forth, which is fascinating. So then you, will, you can look at actually what are the things that will happen as an effect of that. And, and uh, what Carl did, which I thought was fascinating, he, he was looking at LinkedIn. He was looking at over time of the fastest growing uh, new uh, work roles that would appear to replace those, those that didn't exist in the future. And the top 10 list here uh, contained uh, mostly things relating to, to computer science development. So iOS developer, social media intern, or my own profession that we're educating, user experience designers, that's what I educate. Also Zumba instructors, <laughs> one of the fastest growth. Or, or beach body coach. But apart from those two, there's actually every job is relating to digitization. So, uh, and we've actually in our commission then tried to define what is digitization because many people that talk about digitization talks about turn, turning written things into zero and one yeah. uh, things. But we're actually talking about digitization as, as a process that changes the entire society. Mm. And we've seen this happening now for, for the music industry, for, for uh, banks, and for all sorts of things in relation to that. And, and the problem, I'm going to end with two pictures from my own research. The problems are the areas where you actually would need more things to happen. Over 20 years' time, I've done research within office work in public administrations. There's 20 years between these two pictures from a workspace. Do you spot the difference? The difference is that the display has become flat, flat yes. and the number of colors on post-it notes have increased. <laughs> Actually, the computer system is actually more or less the same, same. as they had yeah. 20 years ago. So this is the public administration is one of the sectors that, that will be affected quite a bit by the digitization and where there's a lot of development needed. Um, the other sector uh, that is needed is, is my own sector, university education. I uh, uh, was part of a political debate last summer, you know, they gather all politicians on the island outside of Sweden every summer for political debate, and I was in many of those debates. Uh, there, there was the opposition party were complaining about the government saying that for the past eight years that you've been in government, you haven't developed the education anything. And I said, I want to give you a picture. Uh, imagine this picture. Imagine uh, a, a lecture hall where a teacher is standing in front of you to speaking, sort of one-way communication on things. In the audience, there's two people, two people chatting. There's one people reading a different book. There's one person sleeping and things like that. Imagine that picture. Can you see that picture before you? And the picture I was describing was this picture. 
800 years ago, that was what the education looked like. It's not that they haven't changed in eight years. They haven't changed in 800 years. So this is uh, sort of my, my last message here, that, that the next big uh, line of work that needs to develop and change is the education. Uh, in Sweden today, we need to educate people to give them a degree. It's the most important thing is that people get a degree. And I said that I thought we educated them because they should have a knowledge. And then, then my rector at the university, the president of the university, say, you may say that as the digital champion, but as a professor at our university, you don't say things <laughs> like that. <laughs> and so I believe that we will have a completely different system in the future, where we will probably use our universities like every individual will have a relationship with four or five different universities where they will continue to come back and refill new knowledge all through their life. Universities need to play a much bigger role, not only under the five years that you do a computer or an education of some sort, but in the rest of the working life and also earlier to show what, what uh, we can contribute and benefit from um, all, already at kindergarten, because 50% of two-year-olds, that's mm -hmm. where it starts. Mm -hmm. So let that be the sort of last words. And